The accent, in case you're wondering, is actually from Sydney. Um, in reading the uh, Gordon brochure, well, it's not the Gordon brochure, it's the awards dinner brochure, so I take that back, but the mission of the center is to educate and train effective engineering leaders who create new products and jobs and that benefit society. I actually think that's wonderful. So, in fact, I think it's wonderful because that's actually the theme of my talk. <laughs> so, thank you, Ebene or whoever produced the brochure. Um, Frida's given a little bit away in terms of talking about uh, sleep apnea, but it's, it's a bit beyond sleep apnea, it's uh, sleep disordered breathing. So, um, uh, the company, uh, that, I, that a bunch of us, but actually six of us, set up um, some 22 years ago. I know I look a lot younger than that, but uh, the company's called ResMed, which is short for respiratory medicine. But as, as uh, Dean Seibel has uh, given the game away, it's uh, uh, really we're in the business of, of sleep. And it's actually sleep disordered breathing, which is a little broader than, than sleep apnea, uh, because it represents um, uh, um, snoring and flow limitation, like heavy breathing, hyperpnea's, which is over breathing, like a panting, hypoxia, where the upper airway is closing, and also a frank apnea. So I think the best way to do that is to, to you know, we, we don't have any slides or animation, so I'll be it. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's snoring, <laughs> and then, <laughs> <laughs> and that's an apnea, it's actually, where the, thank you very much. So I think you get the message. So thank you all very much for listening. No, it, it's uh, it's uh, it is the butt of jokes. I mean, snoring is the butt of jokes, but in in fact, it causes uh, hypertension. Regular snoring causes high blood pressure, which in turn causes transient ischemic attack, stroke, and heart attack. Now, so, but let me step back to uh, the triumvirate of health. A, a few years ago, uh, I was in Japan with Dr. William C. DeMent from Stanford. And Bill uh, actually started modern day sleep medicine at Stanford because he and a, a colleague, Christian Guimano from Montpellier in France, started a sleep lab at Stanford. And that was in 1969, 1970. And they were interested in sleep disorders and they developed a technique called polysomnography. And because Bill and Christian were both neurologists, well, what are you gonna do if you're a neurologist? It's just like if you're a carpenter uh, and you got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So they, they started to do uh, EEG, electroencephalograms, investigating sleep disorders. Uh, and uh, they were interested specifically in narcolepsy but they started finding all these people that were snorers and had apnea. And anyway, it's a long story which I won't go into, but Bill was talking about the history of, of, of starting sleep disordered breathing at Stanford. And when we were, I was with him in Japan and he was talking to a, a, a group of primary care physicians, internists and so forth. And he said, look, uh, sleep is part of the triumvirate of health. If you think about a circle, and we don't have a screen here or whatever. Actually, I need slides. Is it too late to get a projector? <laughs> anyway, so I'll, I'll just, again, try to do it like this so everybody knows what a circle is. So the circle's divided into three parts. That's kind of easy. So even in the dysfunctional uh, K through 12 uh, California system here, most students, when they graduate, understand that nutrition is important, a balanced diet whatever that means, but it means fruit and vegetables and other stuff. But anyway, it also means probably high fiber, low fat, and there's no actual proof of that, but it sounds like a good idea and you know, the Bantu did it, so 
It's a bit like global whining. There's not really much proof uh, there. But anyway, it's, it, you can assert it. And anyway, um, so and uh, all, the other part of it is uh, physical activity or physical fitness. It, it's, everybody knows if you're physically active, you, you, you tend to perform better, you sleep better, and so forth. Better to be fit. You don't have to be. If you're a triathlete, that's good, but you don't have to be. Um, and the other, the other uh, third of that, that uh, equation, or the circle, is sleep. And if, you get, if I give you one message tonight, it is if, you, if your sleep is not healthy, you can't be healthy. And um, the, the, you know, it's, it's funny how we're, we're just only waking up to sleep. And that's the message. We need to wake up to sleep. Uh, and it's interesting why it's taken so long. And I think it's because in the medical profession, uh, it's, it's common to say, well, look, uh, you, you look OK, um, but it's getting a bit late, so I'll see you in the morning. And what they should say is, I'll see you in the morning if you get there, if you make it. Most people die at night. I'm not talking about car accidents or whatever, but natural death, uh, often heart attack, often at night. Um, excuse me, do we have any water here? Um, can I just get... Olivia, can I borrow... My wife's here, so can I borrow... Oh, gosh, have you been drinking out of this, Julie? No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyway, since I only have about 25 minutes, I'd better get off this track. But, but it's part of the, the triumvirate of, of health, sleep. Now, ResMed, the company we started uh, in 1989, 22 years ago, um, we've grown at a compound annual growth rate of about 15 to 20% at both the top and bottom line, so not, not horrible. And uh, we were listed uh, on the, uh, the Forbes uh, 200 best small companies in America for 10 consecutive years from 1997 to 2006. And it's not easy. I won't go into the, the background there, but they, they measure five things, and we did the five things, whatever. And we've had uh, 67 consecutive record quarters since we went public in 1995. And um, that's, I should say, consecutive quarters in terms of uh, revenue growth. Uh, we, we had one or two issues with profit, um, which I won't go into, but we, we still increased year over year. So we have revenues which are now approaching about 1.5 billion, and we're in 80 countries, and we have an, in, an impact, uh, sorry, a net profit after tax of around 16 percent, and a market capitalization of around 4.5 uh, billion. Although I will say that we had our earnings call yesterday, and the uh, the analysts didn't like it, so they tanked the stock. Uh, I can't say this, but but please keep it confidential. I think it's actually not a bad buy, but. <laughs> Anyway, the, 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 and, and I, I actually didn't say that, but, but our results just came. I mean, it's just analysts are sort of unusual people. Anyway, uh, ResMed, I, I believe, is a company based on innovation, entrepreneurship, technology, and what I would call interactive leadership. So I just want to say a little bit about those, those topics, um, if I may. Now, uh, I sit on the, the RADI, um, business school board here. I think Bob Sullivan is fantastic, almost as good as uh, Dean Seibel. Um, actually, they're, they're kind of comparable. No, Bob Sullivan does a, a very good job. But I think in most business schools, people talk about entrepreneurship as being risk-taking, which I think is actually ridiculous. Um, entrepreneurship is about seizing opportunities. Everything's risky. I mean, walking across the street, driving a car, but entrepreneurs don't go into a business because they think it's a huge risk. They go in there because they think it's an opportunity. If you're inside the tent looking out, you're, you're not thinking, you're seeing a bit further over the horizon than the next guy. If you're outside the tent looking in, you don't understand what's going on inside the tent. So you think it looks like a risk. But the reason you do it is because you think it's an opportunity. You don't do it because you think you're going to lose the farm. You, think you, you do it because you think you're going to actually make a contribution. And by the way, the important thing is to make a contribution, not to make money. Money comes if the contribution is worthwhile. You never do anything. You might as well get into the drug trade. 
You've got to be very careful, though. And get out early after you make a big hit. I mean, it's... So you don't do stuff for money. That's, uh, I mean, crazy. So it's opportunity seeking. And innovation... Uh, most people, I find, don't understand what innovation is. I could ask some questions and we could have some... But I'm, I don't want to run out... In fact, I'm almost out of time. No, um, I don't want to run out of time. But innovation does involve creativity. It does involve imagination. But innovation doesn't occur until it is anointed, until it is anointed by the marketplace. Innovation occurs when somebody writes a check. If nobody has written a check, it is not innovation, does not exist. Um, and it's curious how people talk about innovative this, innovative that. Well, if, if it's not anointed by the marketplace, it's not innovation. You have to deliver it into the marketplace and people have to say, wow, that's a contribution, I'm going to write a check because I think it's value. So that's innovation. If you disagree, we can talk about it later. Now, um, the... The enabler, mostly the enabler of innovation and entrepreneurship is technology. Um, technology is the turbocharger of the future. It always has been, it always will be. Technology is the driving force of just about everything we do. Now, if we apply technology to something we already know and understand, it's productivity. It's like a, something we're familiar with, we apply technology to it, add a little bit of value, we do it quicker, more efficiently, whatever, that's productivity increase. Now, if we apply technology to something completely new and we successfully market it and you get paid for it, that's innovation. But, it, but it's the key to it. Now, Bob uh, Solo at MIT, an economist, got the Nobel Prize in 1987. Uh, he was studying uh, US... Uh, uh, growth rates over a 60-year period, and he looked at inputs and outputs, the usual sort of things, labour and capital and so forth, and he couldn't explain 80% of what, what drove the, the growth in the United States over, his, over a 60-year period. And he concluded that it must have been productivity, and in retrospect, we know that it was actually technology driving the, the productivity. Okay, now um, I just want to say a few words about leadership. If you look up leadership in Wikipedia, and people who've used a lot of Wikipedia will understand it's not perfect. And I'll give you the definition in Wikipedia of what leader leadership's about. It's about organising a group of people to achieve a common goal, uh, and I would say that's a necessary but not a sufficient condition. It's kind of like organising people to give a common goal. Now, I think when we think about leadership, we think of, of leaders. And I don't want to get into politics right now, but if we look around the world at leaders, how many true leaders do we actually have? I can think of actually one, Manmohan Singh of India, PhD uh, from Oxford in economics, very difficult country, 1.2 billion people. I think he's doing actually not a bad job. Here we have 310 million people, and I won't go any further. <laughs> um, but, you know, I would think of somebody like, uh, you know, Maggie Thatcher. Fantastic. I met her. It was wonderful. She was a fabulous, and I'm going to come back to Maggie in a second. And, and Abraham Lincoln. I don't think you have to go back all that far for US presidents. Um, but again, I don't want to get into <laughs> politics as such. This is not a political science um, discussion. But um, the, the thing that resonated with me uh, can, in terms of leadership um, was uh, something that was written by Paul Johnson, whom nobody in this room would know. I'd be surprised if you did. But he, he was at Oxford with Maggie Thatcher. And Maggie Thatcher, interestingly enough, did chemistry at Oxford. So she was sort of scientifically aware. Most of our politicians haven't got a clue about science and one of the reasons that we're in the pickle we're in. But again, I don't want to go near <laughs> politics. But anyway, Paul Johnson, um, who is a philosopher, writes occasionally for Forbes magazine, 
he said that, uh, and as I said, resonated with me, he said the five characteristics of a leader are as follows. Moral courage. And moral courage also means integrity. It also means trust. If you're starting something and people don't trust you, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. You've got to do what you say you're going to do and you've got to mean it. Uh, so moral courage, and sometimes it means, and moral courage means you've got to make choices and you've got to say, you know, we're not going to do that. I know, I know you'd love me to do that and we're friends and all that sort of thing, but it's not going to happen. And I know I might offend you and I'm terribly sorry. I'm happy to buy you a beer or a wine if you want to go to a more expensive taste, but that's it. The second thing is judgment, and judgment is not the same thing as IQ. IQ helps. No question if you're smart, but there are a lot of crooks that have a high IQ. Uh, but an IQ is important, but judgment is, is something um, which uh, it's really common sense, and sadly common sense isn't, isn't that common. It's, it's an ability to recognise what, what makes sense and what you need to do. The third thing is a sense of priority, a sort of understanding of, of, of the terrain that you're looking at. And um, maybe the best there is the, the old Pareto rule. Uh, Pare Vilfredo Pareto was actually an economist in Italy in the early 19th century. And uh, he looked at income in Italy and it turned out that 80% of the income was earned by 20% of the people. And that's where the, where the 2080 rule comes from. Uh, in our business, it's more like the 1090 rule. It's like 90% of your revenues come from 10% of your sales guys or 10% of your activities. But it's, but it's important, you have to set priorities. Uh, the fourth thing was disposal of concentration and effort, an effective allocation of your energy. And there are so many things that can distract you. Uh, words with friends, I know Olivia plays words with friends. Sudoku, whatever. You can waste endless amounts of time. That's why, I don't, that's why I'm not on Facebook. I'll never be on Facebook. In fact, I'd hate to show my face on Facebook, but, um, but it's easy to waste your time on doing things like that. Um, and the, the final thing that, that Johnson talked about was a sense of humour. I mean, you know, you have to laugh at yourself and life in general. Look at the crazy stuff that's happening. And as somebody said years ago, uh, you have to laugh at life because nobody gets out of it alive. Uh, so that's a good reason to, to laugh at it, perhaps. Now, let me move on to something um, a little more specific. And I read this years ago, and I think it was in Fortune. Andy Grove, and uh, Ebenezer, a chemical engineer, very pleased to hear that. Um, but uh, Andy Grove, actually, um, who is the founder of Intel, chairman, CEO, etc. He came from Hungary, um, and he was hungry, and um, went to CCNY in New York, did chemical engineering, and ended up doing a PhD at Berkeley in chemical engineering, and founded uh, a microprocessor company. Kind of interesting. But uh, this article um, uh, years ago, and he, he's got a delightful way. In fact, if I could recommend a couple of books, and one of them's, I mean, they're both quite old, I think one's about 10 years and maybe the other's 20, but high output management. He used to teach courses at Stanford in the business school and uh, he wrote only the paranoid survive and there, there's some truth to that. You've got to keep on your toes and who, who's going to eat my lunch? Anyway, do you have access to world class people? And by that I mean um, not, not hiring the people necessarily, but having access. So we just, uh, a week or so ago, a couple of weeks ago, had a, a, a KO, KOL meeting, a key opinion leader meeting, and we're interested in sleep disorder breathing and cardiac disease, and sleep, sleep disorder breathing and cardiac disease. We had guys from Gothenburg and uh, London and Hull and Duke and, and the Mayo Clinic and Minnesota and UCSD and so forth. And I didn't want to hire any of these guys because I didn't want to change their diapers. I mean, you know, it, it's, 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 you want to have them come in, put them up in a nice hotel, fly them in, have nice dinners, etc. but you're buying their brains and their experience and you say, hey, listen, here's what we're thinking about doing. Do you think we're drinking our bath water? And, and you can say, uh, you know, and you can get into granular stuff and so forth. Anyway, you've got to have that sort of access. Finance for the end game. It's not a question of having all the money up front, but it's, got a, it's a concept of 
If we, if we do certain things and we achieve certain things, the, the pre-money value increases. And then if you take it, the, and at the same time you're de-risking the, the stuff that you're working on, but you're increasing the value. That's the way it goes. And it's like us now. We, we, you know, we've got you know, several hundred million bucks worth of free cash. Well, we'll pay more for something if it's de-risked. I mean, that's just the way it is. Big guys pay more. Why? Because somebody else has taken the risk and, and, and you're willing to pay more. And that's the way the system goes. Timing. Uh, will it happen in our lifetime? I don't do stuff that won't happen in my lifetime. And that stuff's getting smaller and smaller, uh, the things that I want to get into. I call it the 4-2 rule. It takes you four times as long and costs you twice as much money. Or it costs you four times as much money and only takes you twice as long. And the number of stuff that I've invested in or that we've invested in, that thing tends to hold up. And then if you're looking at something, do you really understand the technology and, and do you really have strong IP, robust IP? And if you're dissatisfied about that, you've then got to ask yourself, are we the right guys to do it? And if we're not the right guys to do it, can we find people that can help us do it? And if you can't, forget about it. And the final thing is, you've got to have a high tolerance for bad news. Bad things happen. Crazy things happen, and you've got to get up in the morning and say, God, we've got to deal with all this crap, but God damn it, I'm happy I got into this business. I love it. And if you can't say that, don't do it. Now, not many things get held up on that filter, but the stuff that does, you've got to love it, but it's also got to pay the rent. So then you do a robust financial analysis, and it doesn't matter really what you use. You can do net present values, a negative net present value we found is not a good signal. <laughs> um, a break-even analysis, if you never get to break-even, that's also not so good. Uh, Monte Carlo, if you really want to get into it, economic value added. Generally, these things all move in the, the same direction, but as I say, it's got to pay the rent, and then you love it. So, Okay, so ResMed, how much time do I have? Um, Olivia, I'm not asking you. You said five, five minutes, any more than five, no. But you've heard me speak before, Olivia, it's not fair. But anyway, let me, let me just move briefly to ResMed. So our mission is to become the global leader in the development, diagnosis, manufacturer, and treatment of sleep disordered breathing. Now, I'm going to read something that was in the New England Journal of Medicine um, nearly two decades ago. And it was an editorial, and the title of the editorial was Sleep Apnea, a Major Public Health Problem. In fact, sleep apnea is the biggest public health problem on the planet. And I'll come back to that. So, among specific sleep disorders, the most serious in terms of morbidity and mortality is obstructive sleep apnea. It is time for the nation to wake up to the staggering impact of sleep disturbances on the health and welfare of our society, an impact that rivals that of smoking. That was 1983, and Elliot Philipson uh, wrote that. I won't talk about Elliot. He's a nice guy. But we don't have time to talk about him. OK, so our, our biggest challenge um, in, in terms of moving the ball down the field, and we're at $1.5 billion, uh, in revenues approximately, but it's the ignorance in all the medical silos. Total, almost total and complete ignorance. Now what we found out, I mean 10 years ago nobody knew about sleep apnea, very few people. Today most primary care physicians, interns, have heard about it. But what they don't understand, the ignorance is about the signs and symptoms. And I'm just going to go quickly through these. And then when I finish this you'll all think you've got it. Um, <laughs> Okay, it is the number one cause of high blood pressure. Number one, on the NIH website, out of nine identifiable causes of high blood pressure, untreated sleep apnea is number one. Uh, and now I'll go through the rest. Heart arrhythmias or atrial fibrillation, morning headaches due to CO2. That's a, that's a case where CO2 is actually important. It's completely unimportant regarding... Olivia, don't... Anyway. Climate, that's a scam, but anyway, let's move on. Morning headaches, depression. Uh, if, you, if you have one bad night, you feel terrible. You have a bad night every single night, 
you get depressed. Nocturia, getting up a lot at night to take a pee. That's nocturia. Now, how many, how, do you, how many urologists do you think say, oh my God, the patient's got nocturia, I better give him a sleep test. I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a hint, not many. Um, reflux, good. Gastroesophageal reflux. Because if you're going and you've got a pyloric sphincter which isn't functioning very well, you get the contents of your gut coming up into the esophagus. And if you're really unlucky, you'll have aspiration pneumonia where you throw it into your lungs. Not a good outcome. Uh, impotence, that's another one. How many people would associate imp impotence with a, a sleep disorder? Because you need slow wave sleep to have hormonal production. Same with kids, they don't grow. Kids with inflamed tonsils and adenoids. How many pediatricians say, oh my God, the kid's not growing, we better take the adenoids and tonsils out because they've got a sleep disorder. Because the, the kids are snoring and having apneas and they're not producing growth hormone. Anyway, I could go on with that. I won't. Uh, type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome is caused by sleep disorder breathing because of sympathetic neural activity. Production of catecholamines that affects the whole of the biochemistry of the body. You treat the sleep disorder breathing, you treat the diabetes. Uh, choking, arousals, cognitive dysfunction, um, fragmented sleep, of course, and daytime drowsiness. They're the early ones. Um, how much time do I have? I'm, I'm going to have to go very quickly. Five minutes? Oh. Okay, I'm going to go quickly. I forgot my prop. I, I'm going to go very quickly, and I'll, I'll, I'll just make um, three comments at the end here. This is a major, major publicly, a, pu a public health problem. The areas where we're focusing on are five. It's sleep disordered breathing and its impact upon and its association with cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. In other words, stroke, atrial fibrillation, heart attack. Second, sleep disorder breathing and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Three, sleep disorder breathing and perioperative death. You don't want to go have an operation if you have sleep disordered breathing and you're getting an anesthetic which gives you central sleep apnea. That's a double whammy. And, and there are deaths all around the country because of unidentified uh, sleep apnea and the patient going under an anesthetic. Sleep disorder breathing and occupational health and safety. Drivers, plane, plane uh, pilots, uh, air traffic controllers, etc. Lots of uh, accidents that have occurred which you can tie straight back to sleep disorder breathing that's untreated. And finally, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease which is the third biggest killer in the country. Um, okay, I'm gonna summarize. Sleep disorder breathing is a major public health problem on a level equivalent to that of tobacco smoking. It is a major cause of hypertension, which is in turn the major cause of heart disease and stroke, the number one and number four killers in most Western countries. Sleep disordered breathing is easy to diagnose, easy to treat, and it has been shockingly neglected by the medical establishment, including the UCSD School of Medicine. No further comment on that. <laughs> Our biggest competitor is ignorance within the various medical silos of the signs and symptoms, as I said. We are the leading global technology company in this space, and we have the track record to prove it. And finally, this opportunity is a marathon, and we are only lacing our shoes, and it is time for the nation, and in fact the world, to wake up to sleep. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Can't go yet. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. I promise you that we did not pick him because he was a chemical engineer, but it was great, right? <laughs> we do good work as chemical engineers. I'm sorry, I had That's to do all right. that. You're okay with that too, right? They I'm may not, not offended. Be. Me neither. Okay. Um, <laughs> I traditionally take, I know we're running a little late, is there one or two questions that's burning in the audience? They're all like, no, oh, we got one. Yep, go ahead, Julia. Uh -oh. Well, thank you very much for asking that question. <laughs> I'm gonna go sit I, down. I, I, <laughs> I don't, yes, this should take less than 20 minutes. No, um, gosh. 
I just feel terrible. I had a prop. I was going to bring a, a mask with me, and I, I, I didn't mention the treatment. The treatment is nasal continuous positive airway pressure, which is basically taking a device where you take room temperature air, filter out the cockroaches, um, to 10 centimetres of water, which as you would know from your high school physics is 1% of atmospheric pressure. Mercury has a density of 13, whatever, so anyway. So 10 centimetres of water, atmospheric pressure is roughly 1,020 sea level. So the only way you can get injured by a CPAP is to pick it up and smash somebody over the head with it. So it's a very, very safe treatment. But you have to wear a mask at night, and it is a, a treatment as opposed to a cure. So you have to wear a mask every night, and people say, oh my god, every night. But, I mean, what do you do before you go to bed? You floss your teeth, I hope you do. <laughs> floss your teeth, clean your teeth, you put your mask on, you're going to sleep, the lights are out, and it's not a big deal. And we've put six million people on treatment. We sell 550,000 masks a month and 100,000 devices in 80 countries. So we, you know, we think there's a business there. Uh, but that's what it is, and there are three types of masks. There are nasal prongs, and I don't have one with me. Uh, I meant to bring one. Uh, then, then you have a nasal mask or a full face mask. So it's either a full face mask if you're a mouth breather, nasal prongs if they work for you, or a nasal mask which, which just uh, covers the the nose and the nares. Very simple, very easy to use, and we make uh, a whole series of these for treating congestive heart failure and so forth, but straight sleep apnea, we have an automated machine where we sell tens of thousands a month. So, but thank you for that question. <laughs> well, thank you so much. So, so, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I have the pleasure of closing out our evening. The first and foremost thing I'd like to do is say, Dr. Farrell, I really appreciate you being here and sharing your wisdom through the years of things that you've taken on and tried. For you guys who are out there, high school, undergrad, grad, and professional, um, who knew you could have such a great career on sleep apnea? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> no, but I think that the key to being a successful engineering leader is looking at where there's an opportunity to solve a problem and there is no judgment in what that problem might be there's just usability and necessity for us as humans in general to use it um, one of the words that um, dr farrell said was if you don't have market conversion i i.e usability most most people see market marketing as money generation but it actually is validation that what you're creating is something that's needed in the world and is filling a gap that exists and we have plenty of gaps in the world so with that i hope you guys take that on all of the people who got awards, our high school students, thank you for being here tonight. Our undergrad and grad and professional fellows, welcome to the world of Gordon Center and engineering leadership. We welcome you into a community that we're engaged in making sure that engineers are prominent and upfront and making sure that technology is used to better our world. And with that, I bid you all a good night. Thank you. Thank you.